So I'm really delighted to be here. Um, seeing the people that I know already um, and then meeting new people, it's always a pleasure because we're only an hour away at UC Irvine. So we should get to know each other and do some things together, like collaborate. <laughs> so um, I want to go briefly over the 25 years of work that uh, we've done on collaboration. Many of you probably don't know, way back in the 1990s, we invented something called Shreddit, which is very much like Google Docs. Bad name. Uh, we see trucks going down the road these days that say Shreddit on it, and they really are shredding things. But this was for Shared Editor, and it was a system that was just on the local network. This is before the internet. Think on that on your local network, and everybody could work on the same document at the same time. I'm going to come back at the end for some of the things that was in that particular system um, that are not in Google Docs today that might be useful. Um, but then we got really interested in uh, much larger collaboration, not just distance collaboration of a team, but huge science teams, teams of a thousand. Um, so the Atlas Project, for example, and you know, watching what the, co the collaboration was there, what the difficulties were, how often you have to be in the same location in order to build trust, all the things that really matter in, a, in that. See, I said that word matter. Distance does matter. I had the guts one time to start a talk by saying distance, and then the whole audience said matters. What if they had not? I mean, what a bad thing to go. All right, we did a lot of work in collaboration in science. There's a book called Scientific Collaboration on the Internet um, that has some key theories in it and a lot of case studies. And then just recently, we wrote a book called Working Together Apart which is a small book, 165 pages, one that you can actually read and just get some lessons from. It's not a big you know, academic tome. It does refer to some things, but it's a book that has a lot of good takeaways in it. But then in, by writing all of these things, we always write collaboratively. We realize that collaborative writing these days is different than it used to be. It's a bit more like the days of Shreddit, but it was only our research team that was using Shreddit. We did a lot of work on it, but we know a lot about tight collaboration. We said, Google Docs is here. Let's do it again. Oh, by the way, I missed something. In this list, it's a collaborative. We always do collaborative writing. But Doc Quo is in the audience. He came down to give me support here. In all this. Just, he's there if you want to talk to him afterwards. OK, we're going to talk about collaborative writing again. There is, in the literature, a very key paper written, as you see, in 1992 about how we write together. This is Posner and Becker's article, and they review by doing interviews, finding out how people were writing then. This is before you had word with tracking changes, and it's before you had Google Docs. Just how do people do it? All the different kinds of roles people take, the stages you go through, the kinds of tools you should be able to have. In fact, they took a whole set of tools that existed in the laboratories back then and analyzed them for various kinds of features on it. And if you'll notice, shred it. Oops, there's shred it. Wait, can you see that? Yeah, there's shred it. And one of the more unique things about it was that it was very free form, like Google Docs is. It doesn't have, you're in this stage now, here's your tools. You're in this stage now, you have those tools. It was just, do whatever you need to do. And people did. They even used Shreddit to do voting on various kinds of things. So um, it's very unstructured. Uh, and now what we have is Google Docs. The whole game has changed now, because in Google Docs and Word, well, Google Docs, anyway, you've got simultaneous writing. How many of you use Google Docs? How many of you write simultaneously? OK. How many of you use revision histories? Uh, it's always fewer. Yeah, OK. So there are revision histories. You can go back and see what you probably do it just the last one or two to find out what's happened. You know, there is a feature now where it says, show me the last things since I looked last. All right, that's very useful because that's more like word with tracking changes. But you know, it's got revision histories, it's got cloud storage. So what we wanted to do is find out how do people write now. So here's what we did. We have a whole corpus here now. We have a survey of students at six different campuses about, it was originally about the rollout of Google Apps on campuses, but we also then asked, do you use Google Docs? Do you have Google here, Google Apps? Right. Even though your email is UCSD, it's actually a Gmail, right? OK. Um, so we surveyed 743 students on six campuses about what they were doing. Both Once you've got the email, then you have access to all the other applications. And we just want to know what people were using. And then when we got to Google Docs, we said, do you work simultaneously? Do you work, et cetera? So there's that survey. We also have a set of 96 documents 
what we did is I was teaching a project management class th for three years in a row, and I made the students use Google Docs. They did. They turned it in by sharing the final thing with me. And then I got permission from them, to, could I use these uh, documents for research? So we have 96 of those. And then once the word got out about DocuViz, I'll show you in a couple minutes, um, some people used it and then shared with us what some of the documents look like. And I'll show you those as well. So we did all kinds of analyses on these. DocuViz will tell you how many hours and hours we did analyses on these. I kept saying, we're not going to be scooped on this research. Nobody would ever do what we're doing. <laughs> All right, so there's some straightforward markers we looked at, like the start time, the elapsed time, uh, who was contributing what. Then we had several coded features, uh, the start pattern, I'll show you those, the, whether there was a leader in this, uh, did they do simultaneous work, and then we judged their quality as well. So we didn't want to use the original grades of these papers because those of you who are teachers know that you don't give a really bad grade for a really bad paper. All right, you, you give them a little bit higher than what they really do. Otherwise, they'll be totally demoralized. So we said, we're going to regrade all the papers. So we got three of the teaching assistants who were in the courses, and they all agreed on a rubric. They graded some together to make sure that the rubric was, they were being consistent. And then they divided them and graded them all. So we have a whole range of, of grades now. All right, we did a bunch of analyses, hierarchical linear regression with some categorical variables. You had to go off learn all of that stuff, simple counts. But what I really like about this research are the examples. Um, and that's why we had to have this picture up here. We had to have a projection um, because we have nice examples. So we have a tool primarily built by Doc, uh, by DocuO called DocuViz. And what it is is a visualization of revision histories. So you take each, each one of these things is a revision history, one of the slices. We call them slices. And these are diffs. These are the differences, what happened between one slice and the next. So you see the orange and the color is person, and the height is how much they did. Furthermore, when it's live, you can hover over a particular chunk, and you can actually see the text. So you get a sense of what's there. So the one on the top, um, you see when somebody deletes things, the, the little triangle goes closed. So here are a bunch of deletions. And then these are big additions. All right, can you read these? This is just sequential, you know, which one came next. And this one is shown in time. That's the same revision history. And this is a move here. Same text, just went down there. Are we OK on that? OK, because these are the pretty pictures. OK, what do we know? Well, we know from the survey that people do share documents. They're not writing alone. They're not d using. Um, the same method they use in uh, Word with tracking changes, where you do stuff and then hand it off to other people. So 76% of the people adopted Google Docs increased, increased the second year. Of those, 87% uh, edited each other's, rising to 90%. We have some inside data on what Google is doing. They actually surveyed the, all the people at Google, and 80% of them edit each other's. They all share, of course, it's Google. Um, and in these class documents, 80% of the edits are both of themselves and other people. All right, so here's what it looks like. Here's a case, you just barely see it in here, where there's little green lines and green stuff, sort of lighter green. That's editing yourself. And over here is a lot of little colors mixed in, and that's editing other people's work. All right. So this is what it looks like. Here's a revision history. I've taken the names off, because they are indeed the people's names. And here's simultaneous work, where we have two people in the document at the same time. And here's where they are. Can you see them? All right. So they're working simultaneously right close to each other. In fact, there's a lot of simultaneous work going on. Um, in fact, that's what oh, goes this way. This is 5 o'clock, 501, 501, 507, 507, 508, 509. So this is a whole long session of simultaneous work. And we're really interested in that, what's really going on. Here's a case where they're simultaneously editing a table. This is in one slice. And all three of them are in the same regions. So they must be talking a lot and then having, you know, doing this shared recording. All right, so we did a qualitative analysis of the style. This is actually our uh, lab room. And we printed out the 96 documents twice, one where it's just the sequential slices, and the other is looking in time. Because walking around 
you get a gestalt about what's going on. What are the patterns you are seeing? And then you go into the actual documents to say what's really happening. Okay? That's our method. So, what we noticed, um, that there are some very common styles of people working. And I'm going to show these pictures to you, you'll see what they mean. But it's starting from scratch, pasting in an outline, pasting in the assignment, Right? They just took it from the electronic, we have something called Triple E, which is our electronic environment. They just took it and pasted it in there, wanting to make sure they finished everything. They pasted in an example. They assign in the document people to sections. They do project management. And there's some that have a whole informal discussion going on inside. And I'll show you what these look like. So here's just from scratch. So Blue opened the document and did nothing. Right? Orange came in and put, wrote quite a bit and more, and then blue came in, all right? And then it looks like almost everybody's there. There's some editing each other stuff, but they just start from scratch. There's no, it is the document. There's nothing sort of deleted at the end. You'll see the other cases there are. All right, here's pasting in an outline. Can you see it? All right, the blue at the beginning then got spread out. And those are just the titles of the different sections. And different people took different, different sections to write. Here's a case where they pasted in the assignment. So again, you can see it. It's the big blue at the beginning that's there for quite a while, and then they say, I've got it all, and they delete it. They still do some more editing over here, right, and adding some things at the end, but that, the whole idea of that assignment's right there for everybody to see. It's right in the document. Here's one of our favorites. It's, this is a business case, and what they did is go on the web and find one. And they pasted it into the document, and then they make, made it melt into their own. They deleted the parts that were irrelevant, and they added their own details, right? And in the end, you can see there's not much left of that original, all right? But there's their, their document. We saw this a lot in, for standard documents. This is a project management class, and if you want to know what a business case looks like, you go find some examples. And they just took it one step further, pasted it in there, and then made it their own. It's not plagiarism. <laughs> it's close, but... All right, here's an explicit project management. Now, the thing you're going to notice here is how much is being developed here, and then what, right near the end? It's all deleted. So as soon as we see a big delete like that, we want to go in and find out what's happening. What are they doing? And this is what it looks like. All right, there's a whole conversation in there, including who's going to be writing which section, and no, we don't need this one. All right, it's all in there. It is. They're planning, they're doing, it's just the place. It's not the document, it's a place, and I'll get to that later. So here's the informal discussion on what that looks like. Um, again, some things get deleted because it's the discussion and not the actual thing. And here's what this looks like. These are two different slices. So they say we need weekly meetings. This is a communication covenant they make at the beginning of the course where they say how are we going to do our stuff, how are we going to coordinate. Um, and then he said, what's the best time for all of us? And they say, Tuesday, th he writes his own, and then the next person puts in their schedule, and then at the end, the whole schedule is there and a time, you know, they've revealed when they're free, and then they also set up a meeting time. But this is my favorite. This is, I teach them that in brainstorming, you should brainstorm alone, and then bring your stuff together and find the best of each. Because if you brainstorm out loud, the first person who talks takes you in that direction. All right, so this class realized that, this, student, this particular team, and all four of them did the whole assignment. Right here. And then what happened? Took the best of each. Didn't see much orange left in there. <laughs> so there was some interesting social dynamics going on here. It's two people, one person interpreted this in the same, so they decided what the final document was going to be, and we never saw orange again. <laughs> so, was that a good choice in that case? It was a medium grade. I mean, it was a good, they were practicing, you know, what they'd learned. Yeah. So I was delighted to see it. It wasn't the best paper. Um, so how many people did all of these things? Well, most of them started from scratch, had outlines, pasted in the assignment. See, this is fairly common. Six people, six documents had the, the example, all right, pasted in there and then melted away. 
Here's pasting in this, uh, assigning people to different sections and then the informal discussions. But of course, people do two things. They'll paste in something and do some project management inside. So this just gives you a distribution of how many, for which this was the only style. So we also wanted to know how they do their editing, how they, whether they used commenting or whether they commented inside the document or just changed things. And we found both formal and informal commenting. So on the left-hand side, they're using commenting. How many use commenting? Yeah. How many of you change things directly? Yeah. OK, different styles. All right, here's the comments. And then over here, and you can't read this quite. All right. The rules will be located in the project every week. And the comment is then in capitals and made yellow. This is not Google doing this. This is the students. All right. And so I don't think we can do this one. The, the word bullshit is up here. but. Um, <laughs> And then there's a comment on that one. But they do it inside the document um, by just changing color so you will notice it. Uh, here's another one. And it's clearly um, somebody who's a programmer because it starts with the slash star star and ends with that saying we're going to del delete this later. It's software engineering. And here's my another favorite. So they were doing keeping stuff in the Google Doc itself. And then he made a lesson about how to use these. All right, so he put the lesson on how to use Google Docs, and then he put a comment in there so they would see it. So lots of things going on in these documents. Another thing we looked at is uh, evenness of participation. So is it one person doing it and another one just doing a few edits, or is everybody in there? And the one at the top is clearly written by blue, and the one at the bottom is quite even in its participation. So our participation goes from one to 75, sorry, 100 to 75. It's just a measure of how even uh, the documents. And the mean was 95. Very high. All right, the, yes? Is there something like a first mover's advantage? If I create the first draft, then do I have a better chance of keeping my text? Um, it turns out, so every, f each blue is the first person. And if you go back and look in the whole room, blue is not the one that is not the dominant color. So um, you're saying if, what's your actual question? Like, yeah, if I put the first uh, bit of text in or the last bit, do I have a better chance of keeping it in, in the final? Oh, I see. Does the first stuff stay, is what you're asking. Or any of the steps, if I can decide. Uh, I don't know. We didn't look at that, actually. OK, so we graded all these papers. To this whole hierarchical linear regression. I won't show you what the model looks like. It's always ugly to look at. Um, but there's three things that were uh, related to quality. Controlling for all kinds of variables. All right. Even though the documents had different lengths themselves, within a document, the longer the better. That makes sense. All right. It's more complete. All right. There's more thought that went into that thing. I can't imagine that going to be true forever. Um, that you know, if it's a 4,000 pages, it's going to be better than something that's 20 pages. So this was just within this context. Evenness or evidence of leadership, right? So if there was somebody who did something in the beginning that was more project managey or the outline or something like that, that led to higher quality. And I love this one: more balanced participation. So that confirms a lot of research about the more you include other people, the better the document's going to be, not just for their contributions, but for their uh, critique as well. All right, so I want to get back to this thing about the document as a place. We found a large number of people who actually would write messages to each other and have planning things inside the document and then delete them. So here's the big deletion here. All right. Um, so the document grows. You can't really, I mean, it's from here. But this is all conversation. And it lasts for a while. And then somebody says, it's time to clean it up. And all of that goes. <coughs> Here's another case. You're looking for the little, these kinds of deletions. right? That was a conversation. It looks like what's on the left-hand side, where it's conversation about what we're going to be doing. Um, here's that one with a big commenting. And this one, they cleaned it up twice. This and then that whole bunch right there. So we look at them, these patterns about what's going on and in investigate then inside the document, what are they doing? And it turns out that people are putting all kinds of stuff inside the document. So there'd be URLs, there's the assignment, there are you know, examples. Um, and then because that's the one place you want to go. So there was a system, it's out of my next slide. Oh, no, let's do this one. Um, 
a system called rooms in the 1980s that is what we want. It is everything you're doing on a particular project in the same room. And then when you want to pull out that project, you get everything, including the emails you had most recently about that particular project. A lot of us store stuff in emails, right? There's attachments in there, and that's, OK. You want all of the things so that when you come back to it later to think about that project, it's all there. Question? Yes. Um, is it, did you notice any extracurricular conversations going uh, on in the document? Uh, yes, my next slide. <laughs> so, they pasted this one in. During a very heavy session, when they were working together, right, a lot of simultaneous work, this came in and then got deleted. So, it actually says there, they're talking about their client, and the guy in orange there says, this guy. And so, they <laughs> typed that in, put that in there, and then took it out. So, it was done for humor. Right? We put, so that's extracurricular. We also had little conversations about where somebody was at this time. I'm at the ATM, um, but not about other topics totally. Good question. Um, all right, so uh, some people got wind of the fact that DocuViz exists. I'll give you how to get it later. Uh, and particular, an instructor of English at Hunter College in New York, Andrew Lodell, used it in his class. And so even for single writing as well as collaborative writing, this is an example of what uh, one of the students did. Here's a document being uh, developed. Then he is commenting on it, and then it gets reorganized. Right? So just going back and seeing what's in these things that got added that weren't here earlier is a good visual about what the writing process was. Um, these are notes, actually, that Andrew and two of his collaborators did about a course and a curriculum. And what's interesting about this one is that nobody deletes anything. Everything gets pushed down from the top. If you're going to add something, it's at the top, which is where people notice things. Right? If I had to go look for it, I would have to go into revision histories to find out what you did. But this was just pushing things down. This is another favorite. These are standards committee recurring meeting minutes. So they use Google Docs in a meeting, and they have an agenda. They add some stuff. And then they just keep the stuff that we haven't talked about yet for the next meeting. So when you table something, it's still in the document, and they delete the rest. But of course, they can go back to revision history if there's something they wanted to review about a previous um, discussion. And this is the development of an NSF proposal. Yeah, it had to be shortened. <laughs> but what you notice is this is the group getting together at the beginning to brainstorm, and they're just dumping a lot of stuff in there. and then. Something happens here. You can tell immediately that things got shortened. Right? It got a little longer again. This was a redesign. And look, it's a different set of people taking over. So there's, these are stories to tell about the development of a particular proposal. There's more work in progress. Um, just want to review some of these things. Also, DACA was involved in these things. So um, I have edited a lot of papers in my life. In fact, some of you may know uh, Ways of Knowing in HCI, it's a book of the methods. All right, so I was one of the editors of that, and almost all the chapters were co-written. And I'll tell you, on the first drafts, I could tell. So suddenly, the authorship change and the whole style changes. Even, you know, the way they refer to examples, here it's for example, and here it's EG. Or you do ABC, and down here it's bullet points. You go, yeah, get your, you know, get it together. Anyway, so we've developed a, we are in the process of developing a program that will actually say, um, sorry, can we detect these changes automatically? So first of all, I want to show you another program that we have. It's called AuthorViz, and this also is available in the Chrome uh, store, uh, that shows you in a Google Doc who wrote what, the whole document. Sometimes you want to know that just because you, not, you don't want to go change this part of something because you want to know who wrote that. Uh, and you want to have a conversation about it, especially important in policy documents. All right, so this is author viz. So you can see for a Google Doc who wrote what. Um, but what we like to do, we have something called Novox that we are working on, where it will show you, oops, it will show you paragraph by paragraph whether various kinds of things have changed. But let me show you this. So paragraph by paragraph, we count word length, sentence length, active, passive voice, long clauses, however, semicolons, all the stuff. We've, we've interviewed a number of editors about what are the style changes. It's not, not the topic, 
is changing. That has to change because you're doing a whole development of an argument. But you know, how do you detect that the style has actually changed? Um, a lot of words are called function words. They're the prepositions and the connectors and all those. We look at all of those, make a big vector. And what we try to do is, paragraph by paragraph, find the, the dissimilar ones. Right? So it's fairly simple to do. Um, but then flag to the reader, or to the you know, editor, whoever it is, where there's a big change and what that change was. Right? And it may be that you intend it to change. You can imagine in a, in a formal report of uh, an experiment, certainly the, the introduction is different than the methods and the, and the results are different. They've got different styles to them. So it's, just, it's not saying it's bad, it's just saying these styles change. Is that what you meant? So that's Novax. So uh, I also wanted to get back to shred it. So there were some features in there that Google does not have yet. We are working with Google on a lot of these things, so we'll see. And I'm under non-disclosure, so I can't tell you whether they're working on these or not. But these are things in, in shred it. They actually did the first one already. Find, if, if I'm working with a document with Da Quo, right, I want to find where he is simultaneously. So I can now just click on his name at the top, and it'll take me to his text. That's good if you want to have a discussion or just find out what the other person's doing right now. Uh, the other is you want to sometimes track a person. The other person is working and trying to get these conclusions to line up with these signposts. Right? And so he says, oh, I want to do this and this, and then moves, and I would move with him. So basically what we're doing is locking our screens together, and even if he scrolls, and I can see what he's doing. So it's, it's taking you to the other place to be able to uh, talk about things. And then, once you've done that, what you want to do is go back to where you were working. And so that's reclaim last. And then down here, you can also see, these are all shredded. Uh, you can find who is tracking you. So if somebody is watching you work, you might want to know about that. <laughs> so that's shredded. We'd also like to see whether Google could actually incorporate these, the DocuViz stuff. Oh, sorry, there's a question. Yes? Yeah. So was it like an either or situation where either I can look at what I'm doing, the section of the text, or what my co is doing? Yes. Uh, do you think having both of them would be helpful side by side? I could imagine in some situations you want to talk through something, and I want to see whether it uh, jives with what I'm doing over here. I can imagine that. It's like we do split screens and things like that. But we didn't do that at the time. So we also think that DocuViz should be helpful, not just for researchers, but for co-authors to see where we are in a particular document. There are times when, for example, four authors are writing something, and you don't know whether the third author has done it yet. Well, you just do DocuViz and find out how many colors are in there <laughs> and which section is you know, still empty. And, and then instructors, we think they would be helpful too. We also think that there are some features that uh, you'd like to be alerted about in a document. One is what we call seismic activity. There's a lot of stuff happening. Where is it? Right here. There's a, all, the, all the people are in here. You might want to know what that's about. Right? So um, seismic activity. The other is dead air which is something was written for a while and has been there for a while and nobody seems to have edited it. Have you? Is it indeed the final state that you want it in? So looking at dead air and seismic activity we think would be helpful. Well, and then have alerts like uh, uh, Novox. All right, um, we also think there should be some feature for asynchronous writing about having rooms. Um, there is this picture at the top is actually Stukard's wife um, who is uh, a very interesting consultant of social um, activity. I won't get into it. She, when she does her work, she lays it out in the dining room table. Right? So she can see everything. How many of you lay things out on a table? Right? How many put things in files? Oh, for me, the files, it's gone. <laughs> it's it's out, of, out of activity. All right, so the idea is to have that parallel on the, on the computer. Um, so, but I also want to tell you a few stories about another paper we've written recently. Um, what, now that we can write simultaneously, what are the work styles that would be helpful? And since uh, I gave this talk at Google, and Dan Russell said, well, I used to work simultaneously in another system. Gary and I have stories about working with Shreddit. And then there was another guy who had heard he was remote on our talk, and he said that he does something that I will tell you about. Um, to actually speed up the software developer's documentation. So let me tell you that one first. That's the writing documentation at Google. So uh, people don't like to write documentation. Do you like to write documentation? No. 
you like to do the code. All right, so what he says, but at Google, they've got all these people everywhere, and if something's not documented, they will reproduce it elsewhere. I need this, oh, it's not out there, or it's there and I can't understand it, so they don't do docu documentation very well. So Ricardo is a technical writer. He's got some technology background, but he's a writer. And so what he does is get the people to, um, he says, tell me about the software. He writes an outline of what the architecture is. He then asks the, the manager to tell me the four to five people who are the experts in this. He brings them into the room, feeds them, and says, who's gonna write which part? Go, don't worry about whether it's pretty or not, right? Just write it, get the facts down. And then he does that in one day. And then the next days, he actually edits it to make it pretty, and then passes it back to the people to make sure he hasn't changed anything important, and then it's done. And something that normally takes four weeks takes a week. Well, that saves big money and gets all this documentation out. So that's one. Um, collaborative note-taking. So uh, in many of our meetings now, we open a Google Doc, and then somebody takes notes about what's happening. And then as that person speaks, somebody else takes over. Furthermore, somebody else comes along and like Pac-Man comes and corrects things. Or if you have an abbreviation and it's wrong, they spell it out. So it's a collaborative thing that actually at the end, you've got something that's quite readable and much better than the minutes we take of, of ordinary meetings. Um, there's another case I had with Shredda. The visiting committee comes to like the computer science department, five people come and they get a dog and pony show for two days. Everybody presents everything and they're taking notes. And then they have to write a report about what they found. Well, I did something like the documentation thing. I opened Shred It and I had all of the topics from all the dog and pony show and I said, unlike the documentation example, I said, just write what you think. We all came in the same room together and they just wrote. And they wrote, the room was silent for an hour and a half, and they wrote 11 pages. And then somebody said, well, where's the cleanup button? You know, that's, that's the technical writer's job to actually clean things up. But the chair of the committee said, no, that part's easy, I'll do that. As opposed to everybody going home and forgetting things, and then, you know, every two weeks you're reminded that you have to do this report, you actually do it there, and then go home. So we thought we'd write a book called Collaboration for Dummies. <laughs> but basically, it's, those are a great book series. Um, telling people what really is possible these days. Now that you can do this, what kinds of things you, meetings aren't for talking about the work, meetings are for getting the work done. People have to prepare for it, but then you get it done, you get it in a short amount of time. So that's it. I wanted to show you these things. They, these two are available in the Chrome Web Store for download. And if you do it and play with it and you find something interesting, let us know. That's a, that's a phrase I take from the British archives. If you go into the British archives, public can go and get boxes out and take a look at various kinds of things. But there's signs all over the wall saying, tell me if you find something interesting. And so please download it and tell us if you find something interesting. Thank you. Happy to take questions? Yes. So Google Docs doesn't you know, live in isolation. We have all of these tools yes. around us. Can you tell us about how people used Google Docs with other tools, like, uh, uh, you like know, Word? Google's other collaboration uh, features, or Skype, or? Uh, yes, certainly Hangout, <laughs> um, and chat. Because you have to talk about the work. And if you're not co-located, you have to have some way to do that. Um, it's interesting that people use Google Docs for the first part of the work and then they'll clean it up in Word because Google Docs does not have very good formatting. We can't do archive papers in Google Docs. Uh, so you lose the last little part of that, but it's a transfer at that point. Um, well, I think now that we have so many tools and some in the cloud, uh, we have a paper called Thunder in the Cloud in that I now, when I say, where is that file, I'm not sure where to look. Do I look in my hard drive? Do I look in Google Docs? Do I look in Dropbox? Or is it in an email attachment? 20 minutes later, I find it. I'm not very, you know, I don't do the same thing all the time. And I'm not very good at naming my files and stuff. So it's a great search task. So it might be nice to be able to search over everything at the same time. What experience do you have? Do you use Google Docs? Yeah, yeah. And with I what? I use it with chat, chat and hangouts. 
Yeah. Okay. And we dump it into Word. Later dump it on. into Word. <laughs> yeah. Good. It's, it's interesting. So you have the vast amount of data on these students and classes that you have a chance to see patterns rather than my individual. You know. Sort of. Well, that's what's fun about this work in that uh, the students leave a trace of what they did, and we actually think it'd be fun to do these. And show them to people and say, what, what went on here, sort of more socially? Like that big NSF proposal that got rewritten, um, or the one that got all collapsed. So it could be a good probe for uh, asking people about the social dynamics of writing together. But the nice thing about these data, Posner and Becker, it was all interviews. And so people report out what they do. And yet we have this trace of what they did. Yeah. Yeah. So one horrible thing I do as a graduate student is I read those. <laughs> Not yours, just in general. <laughs> and I sometimes wish that there was, some, there was some automated tool which would tell me that, hey, this is a better way to write this particular sentence. Yeah, there is. Uh, there's a Google plugin, um, Pro Writing Aid. Okay, so I and it'll go through it and it, get, it says, there are 27 things wrong with this document. And then it starts with, here's your function words, and you see all of those that are wrong, and then you see this, and then all these things. Try it out. And see whether so it helps. My question was because you have this whole corpus of uh, revisions, and you could see that there are things which stayed and things which got removed. Right. So is it possible to find details about you know this is probably not the right way to present things, whereas this thing has stayed with much higher priority. So maybe you know you could change your sentence to this structure. Like that. I could imagine doing that in ten years. I mean, there's a lot of work to say what are the changes, what level are they, and which one's better, right. and should I advise them about this. I mean, there are times when I edit the same thing over and over again in a document, and I want to hey, say, so the rule is, right? And this is a run-on sentence. And so um, there's probably tools out there that do something like that. Yeah. Yes. And then? Team papers are often given one break and across all the yeah. So you see opportunities there to provide individual grading. Well, I can imagine by looking at the participation, so if somebody wrote the whole paper and you know Fred didn't do anything, then I would give Fred a lower grade, like a zero. Um, although he might be there talking. He might be subscribing what's actually going on there. So we have to be careful about the participation. Uh, but there could be feedback. We noticed that somebody was not, had, did not have their hands on the keyboard here. What was going on? Yeah. Yeah. As a what? As, a, uh, as applied to academic writing? Um, yes. So Ricardo and Dan and Gary and I, having all of our stories about collaborative writing, decided we're going to write the paper simultaneously. So we made an outline. Turned out the outline was a bad outline. And we talked for the first hour and a half about what our message really was. And then we said, we don't really know what our message is until we all read each other's stories. So then we spent the next three hours writing all the stories. And then we talked about, well, what is this all about? And again, we used the document as a place. And we had bullet points going. And we had, it was very funny. We wrote on the wall, on the whiteboard over here. Dan was remote, so he couldn't see it. And he couldn't zoom in. And so we took a picture of it and then emailed it to him. He, in the meantime, was writing on a little piece of paper. And he said, all right, and he put it up on the camera on the Hangout. So we could read that. And we wrote that down. So there were. Multimedia <laughs> of a very funny sort. So I think, so we wrote some of it that way. And then it turned into handoff after that. Um, so you have to talk about how to orchestrate it. But it was a huge amount that we got down in that one day. It's very exhausting. But I think this meetings thing where you hand off to each other, and then you have, that one, sometimes when people are remote, or even in the meeting, if English is not their native language, they look at that as closed captioning of what's really going on. And they can, you know, they get, they get the examples. They get what these people are talking about. We had one case where somebody was remote and wasn't even on audio. All they were was watching the document develop and could make comments then when something was important to them. So it was a little kind of a text, a rich chat. Yeah, Jim. Uh, in comparison of writing tools with programming 
Yeah. Uh, the, like GitHub? Yeah, the kind of support that Primitives has for branching, considering alternative yeah. Yeah. uses, and almost none of that exists in writing. Yep. You know, people still copy a paragraph they're going to change down to the end of the buffer because they don't want to lose it. You know, I don't yep. think people use as much of the going back because the scale of going back is real small granularity kinds of things. Yeah. It just seems like there's really an opportunity, it's an opportunity. to bring in a set of tools that really support the process of writing. Yep. I totally agree. I, we, Gary and I have an example where we would have liked the forking in that, um, so I wrote the first draft of a chapter. He didn't like the second half because it was, he said, not well-grounded and whatever. He didn't say anything. All he did is delete it. <laughs> We're still good. All right. <laughs> So I noticed that after a while. I was still working up here. I noticed it after a while. I said, what? Where did that go? And he said, well, let me try it. And so he started. And I said, oh, I see what you're doing. But that really was in that. I just need to beef up this part. And so I had to go find it and paste it back in. So we would have liked a little help yeah. with that. But I think, yeah, GitHub and all of those coordination tools. Yeah, good. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. You that? Um, we did have some of that going on. These are students writing for a project management class, so they're not that invested in the style or the the difficulty you have. I did notice, however, that um, when Ricardo and Gary and Dan and I were writing together, uh, Ricardo took much longer than we did, and he was crafting things. I would just watch him for a while in the document, and that made him uncomfortable. So I think he would have been a candidate. He didn't want me to see how long it took him to write, because the rest of us were just dumping these things. It wasn't necessarily that ours was better, but uh, that it was revealing his process. I think he would have liked that, to be able to hide it. And that could be an interesting feature, to say, don't show this yet. It could still be in there. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Yeah, right. someone, someone coming by. Exactly. No one working with might actually delete the things that I just wrote. So I usually write it somewhere else and then post Yeah, it. okay. But I think it's also because it's, there, there's no, um, maybe a better way to communicate with the other people while you're writing. Like you said, maybe if there are, I don't know, different, um, I don't know. Yeah, well, I agree with you. It would be nice if you could sort of flag, don't touch this yet. But a little, you could do that probably with a comment. Right. Comment. And I'm not done with this yet. I'll let you know. I'll read. I'll release it when the comment's gone. That could be a way to do it. Or you hide it and then paste it in. <laughs> okay. Oh, we've got one more. Um, you mentioned that uh, one of the criteria of quality is the emergence or the identification of leadership mm -hmm. in the project. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, in the, in the and uh, most of my experience is in the enterprise and corporations. And um, the whole collaborative scene, uh, there is an evolving collaborative leader that, or set of collaborative leadership skills that are mm -hmm. much different these days than, say, in the past. Mm -hmm. How do you discover, what was the evidence of leadership that you saw in the actual writing that um, you could identify, that you could actually point to? Well, um, when they pasted in, they put in an outline and then assigned different people to various sections, that is leadership. Um, commenting later about who was going to do what. Uh, this part's not done yet, and it, that was the same person. Um, so those are some. Can you imagine some others? Uh, well, did that role ever evolve? In other words, that you maybe had one person that was doing the assignment. Did it ever shift to someone else? Yeah, we actually looked for if there's a leader in the first document, is it the same person in the second and third? And it never was. But we encourage the students to experiment in their teams. Don't always take the same role um, because this is a safe environment. You know, this isn't work, this is grades. Um, so, but I could imagine in the real world, <laughs> um, there would be somebody who was skilled at that and called on many times to do that. Well, because collaboration is really great. Yes. And so what one person knows that has expertise and the other person does not. Yep. But there's the, the tendency to be able to shift the leadership to the people who actually are know on that particular part of the project. So there's kind of an evolving or rotating many times. 
yeah. collaborative leader that you begin hearing a lot about in companies like Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. skill, they use that phrase, collaborative leader? Collaborative leadership. Yeah, good. Million. That's yeah. smart. Yeah. Because they are skills to learn. It's a different type of leadership skill. It's not mm -hmm. one person that sets the standards. Right. If someone else knows, you kind of That's, let go of yeah. your role. Yeah, because they have the expertise. Excellent. Good. Yeah, Lily. Um, this is kind of building on or disaggregating that. So to me, it seems like uh, the leadership role that you described in the student documents, mm -hmm. OK, here's some lessons. Here, we need to schedule. Uh, they had a kind of coordination capacity. Right. And then it actually appeared to me that the way you described the role of the Google tech writer was also actually a very similar role. It was a kind of coordination technical kind of capacity. But I feel like when we talk about leadership, the way we talked about those roles were really differently valued <laughs> in the different settings. And I just, I was, I was just interested in that because I found myself thinking, well, okay, is this form of leadership that we're talking about something that, you know, secretaries are often doing? For, you know me, the questions that I obsess about. <laughs> like, I do. So I, I just wanted to ask, I guess that's a, it's an inquiry, you know, did I hear that, that those things were kind of cloudy or? The, well, um, let me see if I understand. I think when in, when the students are doing that, right, they are equals. Uh -huh. And so, yes, they, one takes leadership. They say, oh, good, somebody's on it, uh -huh. you know, and I don't have to do that. Okay. Um, in the other setting, um, there was a very different, oh, all right. So when he's actually doing the documentation job, mm -hmm. his job is to do that. And so people will listen to him and that he is, for the moment, the coordinator and the leader. And I think, I don't know how well he valued he is, except the company better understand that they're now getting documentation. Mm -hmm. um, in, when he took leadership in writing the paper, originally he wrote the original outline, he's working with people who are 20 years older than him. And so he was very deferent about the fact that we trashed his outline. Mm -hmm. So it, it is taking a lead, but I think the way we're using the word leadership is different in those things. But it has to do something with the trust and the power relationships. We can talk about it more later. Okay, this has been fun. Thank you very much.